Well, welcome, welcome. Before we get to the video, Mindy and I are gonna take a couple minutes here and show you an upgrade we made to our house, also known as the THP headquarters. We installed a home security system by Simply Safe. And Simply Safe is actually sponsoring the video today, so we really appreciate them helping us out. Now, currently, our home security system consists of our elderly neighbor across the street and our two geriatric dogs. So it's time for an upgrade. Sorry, Chomp, you're being replaced. So Greg and I don't have a lot of expensive personal belongings. Most of our stuff is actually hand-me-downs, and we really only decorate in deer antlers and pictures that we've taken. But since this is THP headquarters, a lot of our business assets are here. And it just makes sense to protect our biggest investment, which is our home. So as you've seen, we travel a lot during the hunting seasons, and then during the off season, Greg and I like to travel and explore as well. So with spending a lot of time on the road, we decided it was time to put in a home security system so we can leave and just have that peace of mind that things are being protected. So this thing here is home base. All of the sensors connect Welcome wirelessly to, to this. You turn them on and Entry it sensor. says sensor detected. detected. And then you can name it, whether you want it to be the front door, the dining room, all of that. And all of the sensors connect um, just with sticky tape. So no wires, no tools, nothing like that. I think Greg and I had all the sensors put up, connected to the base, and the app downloaded in less than an hour. Once you set it up, you download an app, pick your plan, and there's no contract or hidden fees. You just choose the plan that works best for your budget and your needs. Simply Safe actually protects your home from more than just intrusion as well. There's other helpful sensors that will protect your home. My two personal favorites are a freeze sensor and a water sensor. So let's say you're gone and your furnace goes out or you get water in your basement, then the sensors are gonna go off and let you know. And both of those things have happened to Greg and I in the past, so we're pretty excited about this. So anyways, it's nice to have the peace of mind that comes with having a home security system because we do spend a lot of time traveling. If you've ever thought about home security, we definitely recommend checking out Simply Safe. They've got a lot of things to offer. And if you want to learn more, you can look them up at simplysafe.com backslash the hunting public. What's up, everybody? Today, we're going to be talking about the top five mistakes that public land hunters make. <laughs> That's right. So the first thing that I feel like most people miss, make the mistake of is following the crowd. Most people pull into a public land parking lot, right? They park right there next to all the rest of the trucks. They get on the road or the tractor path or the ridge that leads out of the parking lot and they all go the same direction. They all do the same thing. Yep. And most times there's a pretty good sized public area with like two or three access points. I'm just using that as a random example. Mm -hmm. But there'll be a couple of access points around it where people will park and go in in most cases, there's a big area there to explore, mm -hmm. way off of that path and away from those parking lots. Not to say you can't kill deer close to the parking lots, but if you're doing what everybody else is doing and you're following the crowd, you're probably going to find the crowd and not deer. I think another thing is just road access. When you're looking at a piece of public land, if there's major highways or paved roads that are easily accessible, those are areas that people are going to frequent. That's where the most trucks are going to be parked. But if you get off on those gravel roads, kind of those maybe level B roads, just things yeah. that aren't as well maintained, you're going to get away from a lot of that hunting pressure and kind of get away from the crowd. Another thing is this time of the year. If you are hunting first week in November, you're probably going to run into a lot of other bow hunters. If you're hunting the opener of the gun season, you're probably going to run into a lot of other hunters. It's going to be packed. Yeah. yeah. If, you, if you can hunt maybe middle of the week, you can hunt early season early season is a great example most most states have a long archery season yeah. and most of the pressure is concentrated in a relatively small time frame mm -hmm. if you look at at missouri or iowa for example their archery seasons and in, in like most states come in in either september or early october yep and we don't see a huge influx of hunting pressure until november yeah so there's all there's that entire month or more mm -hmm. where the public land is pretty vacant for the most part. And you might be surprised what the deer will even be doing in those early season time frames where once that pressure hits, you know, they may start tucking back into those holes where they're away from the hunting pressure. But early in the season, for example, you might be surprised with what they may be doing, where they may be moving in daylight. Take advantage of that. If you are only 
taking the time to hunt when everybody else is also, you're going to start finding... You're going to find a crowd. You're going to find more pressured deer, too. Thinking of a way to creatively access the area that you're going to hunt to is, is real important. Like, if you find a spot, for example, where there's a river mm -hmm. or a creek in between the main access and a bunch of other good habitat, as you're looking at the map, and you get down there to that water and it takes a, some sort of waders or a boat or something to get over there, that's going to stop a ton of people. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, if you use a boat or you use waders or whatever, you're getting into a ton of deer that haven't been messed with. Another good example of that would be any elevation change. A lot of hunters aren't willing to walk, you know, down and back up or straight up right out of the parking lot. Uh, in some cases, you know, you can go up and down over several ridges to get away from that hunting pressure. And the more you can do to just separate yourself from that crowd as far as right from the truck to your hunting location, you're gonna up your odds. Another simple, but I think very overlooked thing is if you're hunting close to a road, don't just pull right up to the spot that you're gonna hunt. You know, gravel's loud and a lot of public areas have gravel roads. An example of this would be in Alabama, a couple years ago, Ted and I were hunting close to the road, but we were driving like a half mile down the road, parking and then walking yeah. to that hunting location versus just pulling right up, slamming car doors, stuff like that, making a bunch of noise. What's Dude. number two? Number two is having a that's my tree mentality or being habitual about going to the same areas or the same tree stands, whatever it may be. We kinda. hear that all the time. Or if you're a hunter that is trying to be more efficient because you're on limited time, moving around, being mobile is really going to help that. I think sometimes too, it's easy to go in in the off season, scout an area and think this is the spot and this is the day that I'm going to go there. Well, if you get there and that sign is not fresh, maybe the deer haven't moved into that specific spot yet. They may not be there until the middle of November, and it may be on fire then. Mm -hmm. But that's you... why you got to remain adaptable, and we're going to talk about that in a second. Mm -hmm. All right, the third mistake we see all the time is folks are afraid to leave their comfort zone. They pick their one public area that they like to hunt that's close to their house, and they just hammer that thing. They go back to it all the time and they don't expand and start trying other areas and kind of put together a portfolio of locations. And what you're gonna do when you do that is you're gonna experience different habitats. You're gonna find different terrain features and that's gonna help you learn about deer movement and then you're gonna be able to take that to other places. You may also find that, hey, this habitat type is way better for deer or turkey or whatever you're gonna find it's better for them in your particular area. I mean, you're just gonna learn all this stuff by default by sort of challenging your mind to mm -hmm. figure out all these other areas. And it's gonna put you in a position where you have lots of different options so that you can be efficient. Yep. If you just have one option and you pull into the parking lot to go hunting and there's 10 trucks there, you're gonna get discouraged real quick and it's gonna make it difficult for you to find a spot to hunt that particular day. But if you have plan B, plan C, and so on and so forth in the general area, then you can just bounce to one of those. Yep. Be willing to drive an hour or two away from home. Be willing to explore these new areas on the time that you do have off because if you do, you're going to expand your opportunities and that's going to allow you to be more aggressive when you're hunting. And you know, when you're looking at new areas and you're, you're looking at the map, it seems like, at least in our experience, if we find an area that has limited access and lots of habitat diversity, meaning, you know, there's there's lots of openings, there's lots of thick areas, there's lots of open woods and water running through that area, maybe even some ag around it somewhere. You're talking about the ultimate pot of diversity right mm -hmm. there. And there's gonna be probably lots of deer using that area. If you're looking in contrast at a different area down the road that's just all open woods, yeah. real flat, not much terrain difference, no water, no nothing like that in there, probably gonna be fewer deer in that spot. An easy way I like to think of it is if I'm looking at a map and I see a bunch of color differences, Yeah, that's telling me that there's a lot of habitat diversity. There's different vegetation types that are meeting. So if you've got multiple different colors on the map that are kind of coming together, that's something that is probably worth going and putting your boots on the ground scouting out to see what the deer density is like in that area. Yeah, and we also refer to it as edge or transitions. Yep. If you've watched our videos in the past, there's all kinds of subtle transitions in edge 
within a very diverse habitat. Those are the areas where they're going to travel, those are the areas where they're going to bed, those are the areas where they're going to feed, just because they have so much more available there. Put it this way, if you go up to a salad bar, are you just going to get salad out of the bowl, or are you going to put some potato salad on there? Are you going to put some like ranch dressing? Eggs. I like eggs on mine. Put some eggs, maybe some croutons <laughs> on it, you know, maybe some broccoli, whatever. You're probably going to get a little bit of everything, if you're like most people. Deer are going to be the same way. They want the yeah. diversity within their diet, and that's going to put higher deer densities in areas of higher diversity. Yep. And that kind of leads into the next mistake, number four, is being too conservative. Unfortunately, a lot of hunting media is telling you to play it safe all the time. And when you're hunting public land, that situation is not the same. Yeah, and we talked about earlier, you may have limited time. If you're, you know, an average person with a five day work week and a family or whatever, you may only have a certain amount of days that you can get out and you may not even have control over those days that mm -hmm. you can hunt. So if you're too conservative and you're out of the game, especially if you're archery hunting, mm -hmm. the odds of you actually killing something are gonna go down. You know, you could sit on along a field edge and you could potentially see more deer. Maybe that's a good option to do right before the season or for your very first hunt of the year to kind of figure out how things are, mm -hmm. you know, playing out in that area. But you're going to have to dive in there and get closer. That's why you always see us hunting bedding areas mm -hmm. and stuff. People a lot of times are worried about spooking deer. And while you don't necessarily want to spook deer in a hunt, sometimes you're going to have to spook deer to, for one, learn about them, and two, you have to push it a little bit because if you're not pushing it, you're usually not getting close enough. Well, from our experiences, Ed's just out here mowing. Just right there. Thanks for good audio. <laughs> from our experience too, we've bumped deer many times and seen those same deer in the same general vicinities within the next, I mean the next day. There's a lot of situations too where we bump deer and then we shoot that same deer. So don't get discouraged if you're spooking deer. It's not the end of the world. It's not gonna ruin your season. Okay, number five, this is the last mistake and this might be the most frequent mistake. This mm -hmm. is like the biggest hang up for everybody. And it was for me for a long time. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean it still totally, is for us. Yeah, and that's getting discouraged. So many times on public land, you'll go in with this great plan in your head and you're like, man, I'm gonna go back to this spot that I scouted back in August or April or whatever, found these big rubs, I can't wait to get in there. Then you get in there and you, you're either not finding deer sign or more often you're running into other people. That's the biggest thing. I mean, there's like a million horror stories of, I hunt that public, I've hunted that public land and there's people everywhere, there's tree stands everywhere. And while that may be the case, if you're adaptable and you're willing to like, you know, keep a positive mentality is the biggest starting point. If you see these things, don't get discouraged. Just continue to adapt because if the situation isn't exactly what you want it to be, you can find it somewhere else. In fact, a lot of people look at finding tree stands and finding hunters as a disadvantage. We do not. Mm -hmm. Like we, it's, a, it's actually a positive thing if you're finding hunting pressure because you can then predict where that pressure is coming from. And the deer are going to be avoiding that spot. So say, for instance, you have 500 acres of land right there. If you're finding tree stands and you're finding hunting pressure in two thirds of it, I bet you the other third of that 500 acres is going to be really good. It's probably going to be loaded with deer, more deer than it would have otherwise, because the rest of it is full of hunters. And it's not going to be easy. You know, there's going to be some times where you go through the struggle time period, oh, maybe, yeah. maybe even for a couple of weeks throughout the season. But if you keep that positive attitude and you continue to adapt and just try different stuff, you're really going to have a good time. You're going to learn a lot. It's going to be more rewarding that yeah. way. And a note also, sidebar, like work together with other hunters too. Mm -hmm. They have just as much right to be there yeah. as you do. Um, I used to get discouraged about that. I'd walk in there and I'd see somebody else hunting in my spot or whatever, and I'd stomp back to the truck. But mm -hmm. like that ain't the right way to be. Just mm -hmm. go and talk to people. If you meet them up at the parking lot and you see them there, talk to them. Ask them kind of which direction they're going. And then that way the two of you can form a plan together at that point and go in there and both maybe have a good hunt. Yep. If you don't talk to those people and if you're real reclusive and apprehensive about them, before you know it, you walk two miles in there and you're sitting up right on top of each other. The other thing that you might find out if you're talking with people is maybe they've been here for a week and they're about to leave and they're not gonna come back for the rest of the season. You know, you know, They may give you a bunch of really useful information yeah. at that point. Yeah, so just talking with your fellow hunters and ultimately being positive, I think, is the most important thing on that topic.
That's right. There's your five mistakes that we see public land hunters make. We've made them all. I'm sure all of you guys that hunt public land have too. But if you avoid them, it's going to up your odds and it's going to make you have a lot better time out there. Good luck. Thanks for watching. Put some music here at the end. You got a video. <laughs>